Hello and welcome to another episode of the Buckle Bomb Show here on Bomb Media Productions. I am your host, Bobby. I am so happy to be here with you to talk professional wrestling today. My, I'm here with my broadcast partner, Anthony Rohn. Tony, how are you doing, buddy? Just like Ric Flair ripping up our Tampa Bay nightclubs, you can't stop us, you can't control us, but you can only hope to contain how many people are riding on our Space Mountain tonight with this show. It's great to be back, brother. All right, buddy. Yeah, after our uh, live streams last week, I did nine hours, and you were kind enough to follow me for, for day two. That was that was a lot. I was kind of out of it for, for almost all week. Um, I don't know if you saw on... Um, on Facebook, I shared a, a post on my personal Facebook about, and it was just the meme of Pat off doing the beers while he's chugging the beer while he's passed out after the stunner on the side. And I'm like, how, how I'm about to be after live streaming nine straight hours in two days. But, yeah. <laughs> and that's pretty much how I was all week. I, but uh, we'll go ahead and jump right into it here. Our very first topic it's going to be about Cody Rhodes. He made his big return at WrestleMania uh, this past weekend. And he also uh, is going to be on the Raw brand. And he made, came out at the beginning of Raw, had a fantastic promo talking about his dad, Dusty, how his dad, and they showed a picture of the Titantron of Dusty Rhodes holding the WWF title uh, in a, after he had seemingly won it in the classic Dusty finish. Uh, but he won it by count out, so it didn't count. And it went back to, uh, I believe it was superstar Billy Graham he was fighting in that match. Um, and he talked about how that moment is actually what inspired him to get into wrestling. He wanted to become WWE champion to uh, give that belt to his dad. And of course, now his dad's not here any longer. Uh, and that dream has died, but he still has the dream of that, of that belt being with the American Nightmare now. What did you think of this promo and uh, and his appearance on Raw? And the, as you know, I'm a big fan of Cody Rhodes and the entire Rhodes family. Um, unfortunately, there's just something to how emotional Cody gets when he's up there talking about his dad. It just sometimes it feels like he's laying it on a little thick, and I understand that. But I will also never knock a promo where they can quote Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> I did. I did like that. Like he said, oh, I've been reading a lot lately. I'm pretty well read. And I came across this quote recently and it was from Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> the novel great. Kung Fu Panda. Right. right. Is way better than the movie. Uh, but yeah, it was it was fantastic. Maybe a little heavy handed, but I do believe and he's been saying this in interviews. He said it on the bump as well. And in other interviews, he said basically the same thing that he said in that promo. You know, and I do believe it's legit his motivation for coming back to WWE. Um, he also I don't know if you caught it. He had a dark match after the show with Kevin Owens real quick. And he said some more. Did you see any of that? Um. I saw the hug that opened up the dark match. Mm. Um, it, to be honest with you, it's kind of a head scratcher about why you would have Cody Rhodes' first match on Raw in over six years be a dark match at the end. Well, I think they're saving his actual first match on Raw as something they can promote later on. This is Cody Rhodes coming back. He's opening the show. Great promo. He's back in WWE. Now, this coming Monday... We can talk about this for a minute. Uh, he's promoted for his first match back on Raw. It's going to be against The Miz, which creates a hubbub because certain segments of the IWC don't like The Miz. But I think it's actually going to be a fantastic match. I actually have grown to like The Miz a lot in the last few years. But getting back to what I was saying, now I forget what I was saying. My train of thought completely left me there. Uh, oh, uh, with the Kevin Owens thing after Raw, I think that was simply to send the fans home happy um, after Raw ended. It wasn't a quick, it was a very quick match. Like from bell to bell, it was probably three minutes. Cody went over and then he cut another promo with the fans and and literally said, I'm so glad I was chosen to make you go home happy. And it was, it was almost an AEW style promo. It was really nice. And he stuck around after uh after the match and after all fans videos ended and all that stuff 
and hung out with the fans in, in attendance for quite a while after that, from what I hear. Um, but yeah, what do you think of next week's match uh, against the Miz? Uh, myself, personally, I'm a big fan of the Miz. Uh, he is, next to MJF, one of the top heels in the industry right now. Um, the only thing that concerns me is WWE kind of has a bad habit of blurring the storylines. So I swear to God, if Logan Paul comes out and interferes in this match, you know, I, I might get physically sick. <laughs> you liked Logan Paul at Mania. No, I still like Logan Paul at Mania. I like where they're going with this, but God damn, give Cody light, give Cody Rhodes his limelight, let him shine without creating some hubbub around it. Well, if this is going to be Cody's first uh, little uh, program, if this is going to be Cody's first program uh, back in WWE, is a little program maybe going into WrestleMania Backlash against uh, The Miz and Logan Paul, I'm not too upset about that. Though I, I would imagine the Mysterios still have unfinished business with them, and that would go into Backlash, WrestleMania Backlash. Um, and they did tease that they weren't finished with Seth Rollins and Cody Rhodes either on Raw. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens there. But uh, definitely, I think Logan Paul will have some sort of influence on that match. Oh yeah. Now the thing that intrigues me the most is you know all the places you can actually go if they were to continue with Seth and Cody, uh, especially given uh, Seth's hot takes on his former uh company <laughs> right so, we shall see all right we'll go on to our next subject here and that will be uh and again on raw we had mvp turning on bobby lashley and joining the monster omos uh did you see this segment uh and what did you think of it I'll tell you what, man, that was, uh, it, it was very unexpected to me. Uh, the way they had the hurt business, you know, I, I was legitimately pissed off when they had that little, like the hurt business isn't a thing anymore. And then they split from like Shelton and, uh, Cedric and I just mm -hmm. bring them back together. Perfect. This is a stable that has the potential to make history in the likes of the four horsemen. If you play them right you keep making lashley look strong as hell and then all of a sudden man boom all in favor for a bigger monster mvp goes with homos it's uh it's going to be interesting to see where this goes I, I i'm not the most excited for it but it does have potential see i yeah it definitely has potential and i am excited for it i think i think this is exactly what omos needs he's got a mouthpiece now i you remember, I was very much like, oh, there's no way Bobby Lashley's winning at WrestleMania. There's no way. There's no way. It's got to be Omos. They got to put him over. And all of a sudden, Bobby Lashley went over, and I was wrong. What the hell are they going for here? And then this happened on Raw the next night. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Omos immediately gets his heat back. Bobby Lashley is now babyface. So he doesn't need MVP sitting there behind him. You move MVP with Omos. Omos has a mouthpiece now. He's a monster. This is this is your new Brock and Paul Heyman, circa two thousand two, in my opinion. Very very possible. Um, I just I'm happy that what I predicted is looking to be wrong right now. Uh, if you remember heading into Mania, I said Bobby was going to go over because Vince McMahon is tired of his new toy because he has something shinier in the weight. Uh, fortunately, though, it looked like I'm going to be eating crow on that one and almost is actually going to get his chance to be a giant monster in WWE, which I'll tell you what, man, we live in a day and age where the giant monster isn't such a uh, thing anymore like it used to be back in the 80s and 90s. If you would have... Kane's debut today, like he debuted back in the Attitude Era, it would just kind of be ho hum, you would think, after uh, the size of some of the wrestlers we've seen the last 10, 15 years, right? I actually disagree because I think your average size of your wrestler on TV, they've gotten smaller. 
So when you have a Bobby Lashley is a monster out there compared to some of these guys and is built like one and, and pushed like one and promoted like one, and then you put him in the ring with Omos, who's legit humongous and just yeah. towers over Bobby Lashley, I think that can actually help even more because this guy's huge. This guy's probably Kevin Nash size, if not a little bigger, which in today's age, you know, is huge. You know, when, you know, we've been talking about Scott Hall, obviously, with his recent passing, people forget how big he was, but that's because he was standing next to Kevin Nash most of the time. Yeah. Uh, but he was he was legit like six 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 seven, you know he was as as big as Hulk Hogan. So you don't have a lot of that today. You've got your you got your Mrs. and your Finn Balors and your you know your guys that are they're they're certainly not small by any stretch, but much much smaller on average. Um, well, then then you have to look you know just devil's advocate here. Then you have your. Lance Archers, and you have your uh, Abysses, you have uh, your Brian Cages. Uh, there's actually a lot of guys out there that are still incredibly large in stature, but it, mm-hmm. their stature isn't made to be like such like a uh, God, this guy's a skyscraper kind of bit anymore, I feel like. Right. They don't push the size like they used to, except in certain situations like a Braun Strowman, like an Omos, when it's obvious. And just a, a natural beast like Brock Lesnar, you know, he's just, even though he's not necessarily the biggest guy, he is huge nonetheless, and you can still push that. But a lot of the guys, you just, especially when, you ha- you, when you're in an era with the bigger guy isn't, they're having equal matches with like a Finn Balor and things like that you don't necessarily want to oversell the size. But in Omos's case, you definitely do. All right, uh, we're flying through topics here today. We'll move on to our next subject here. I keep going to the wrong thing there, uh, to the wrong screen. <laughs> I always go to you instead of me. Uh, the next subject here is uh, we're going to be talking about the FTR versus Young Bucks match on Dynamite, which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, how much of this match did you see? Did you see the whole thing? I'll tell you what, I watched the whole thing, man, and hats off to FTR for not giving us one, but two five-star quality matches in the span of five days, man. You know, they go, they'll tell you they're the top guys, and man, I'll tell you what, if you don't believe it after this week, what's wrong with you? Man, uh, I unfortunately did not get to see this match live. Uh, I, I wasn't watching Dynamite, and so I've only seen... um the YouTube shortened version that AEW put out, um, which was like the last eight minutes or so of the match. Still absolutely fantastic. I was in for all the whole time. Such a good match. Um, the best the Young Bucks have ever looked to me. I'm not a big Young Bucks fan. So, yeah, this was this was incredible. And for sure, having two uh, matches of this caliber within four days of each other, five days of each other, was just... Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. And, you know, that's my that's my other side to this is I really want to check out what Jim Cornette has to say about this match because you and I both know for as much as he has a disdain for the Young Bucks, that in that match there is not a single bad thing you could say about them because they kept up and wrestled the style of match that FTR normally produces, which to me was mind-boggling. I can tell you there will still be moments in that match that Cornette will not like. Um, that's a little too flippy and not as storytelling. <laughs> uh, but not focused on the story. But but overall, I think he'll love the match as much as he yeah uh, his as much as he has disdain for the Young Bucks. I think he'll give all the credit to FDR for leading the Young Bucks, whether or not that's the case. But. Yeah, I'm excited to hear what he has to say about it, too. His uh, his podcast is a little much for me sometimes. I enjoy his knowledge of wrestling. Uh, I He does the two podcasts, The Experience and... Uh, uh, drive through The drive through right? And the drive through is more about fan questions. So I, I like that a little bit more because he goes back and tells stories about the olden days and about, you know, the, the Midnight Express and about... 
uh, smoky, brackets. smoky brown, <laughs> smoky mountain, and all that stuff. And doesn't focus when he focuses on today's wrestling. He's got such a hatred for so much of it, and it. I have to turn it off at times and come back to it later because it's just like, well, that's a little too much, a little too much Jim Cornette for today. I'll get back to it tomorrow. <laughs> but it, always an entertaining listen for sure. Anything else to say about this match or where where we think uh, they're going in the future here I, with this? I'll tell you what, man. If FTR isn't a three company champion by the end of, say, by the end of May, mm-hmm. yeah, I did, I, I'm going to be really disappointed in that because Jesus Christ, you want to talk about a tag team that's just on a hell of a run right now, and it looks like they threw the brakes in the trash because they don't need them. I mean, they, they're just full bore into everything right now. They they're not putting out a bad match. Their promos are more enthused than I've seen them the entire run with AEW, and that's including having Tolly Blanchard as a mouthpiece. I mean, FTR seems like they found like a new vibrant passion for professional wrestling again. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, did I also see something like they're going to be wrestling the Briscoes again in GCW coming up? I did not see that, though. I would not be surprised if that happens. I mean, yeah, give me part two for Briscoes and FTR. I mean, wow. Yeah, if we can get a part two for that. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Obviously, the Briscoes, um, I think they recently lost on Impact this week. So they lost a couple of matches this week, uh, high-profile matches. But they are still your GCW Tag Team Champions. And, yeah, let me see if I can find something on that. Where do you think uh, the Young Bucks go here uh, from here on out? Are they? I, I, think, uh, I think we're going to get our wish, to be honest with you. You know, Kenny's still, what, four to six months out from coming back to TV? Um. And with Ring of Honor coming back, and you don't know if they're going to be doing a weekly show or if it's going to be on YouTube or if they're going to get their streaming deal ironed out, I think the Young Bucks go away for a little bit to Ring of Honor. I think they get some of the uh, some of the want back from the crowd to see them again because even though I'm a fan of the Young Bucks, I've even been noticing lately on television that Young Bucks just aren't getting a pop anymore to save their lives. And it's the weirdest thing ever because, you know, people get more excited to watch their uh, Twitter bios change than they do to actually see them wrestle in person. So I think that's the uh, biggest telling sign of what's about to happen with the Young Bucks. But as long as we got FTR keep on rolling through, the Young Bucks can come back when it's their time again. Yeah, I'm excited to see FTR get pushed as the best tag team in the world and as huge baby faces. The Bucks, again, I'm not a big fan of them, and they have exciting matches, but again, I think they're more focused on spots and less on storytelling, whereas FTR is heavy on on the story of the match and, and, you know, and the flow of the match, which is what I love. And I think the Young Bucks style is only going to take them so far. It's taken them quite a ways here. But you put these two side by side, and I think FTR is going to come out on top as far as who the fans are going to like more. Now, obviously, FTR's had a pretty big uh, baby face run here in the last couple of weeks. But I find it interesting, and I really like it, that they're still technically a part of Pinnacle with MJF. Where do you see that going? Do you think uh, that's going to oh, stay yeah, that no, way for done. Pinnacle's done. Like, that, they're, the way that's going right now, which, by the way, I want to talk about making Wardlow look like a damn monster. Oh, yeah. Every week, having the posters up, he can't come through. He's destroying security left and right. He has MJF and Sean Spears freaking the hell out. FTR's looking around like they don't want anything to do with this because even they said, and I believe it was last week or the week before, you know, Wardlow's still our boy. He's still our boy, too. Get your shit figured out. So it's, you know, this is going in a really interesting direction, and I think they're on their absolute pinnacle just based off of getting rid of Tully Blanchard. Now, something that did come to my mind, though, if you remember uh, the day after Jeff Hardy debuted, the Young Bucks in their bio said, Matt and Jeff are back together, but AEW already had a better, younger version of the Hardy Boys, and we call them the Young Bucks. 
Um, I know this match already happened in Lakeland a couple years ago before Mania during the Supercard of Honor. But uh, I, I think we're heading in towards a hardy Young Bucks program here. That would certainly be interesting. I, I didn't know that that match take pla- took place. I, I'm not surprised. Uh, but I'm sure most people don't. So putting that match on national TV or on a pay-per-view, an AEW, you know, big-time pay-per-view would be fantastic, and I'd love to see that match. Um, I, I do want to point out I couldn't find anything about a Briscoe's FTR match at GCW, though that wouldn't surprise me if they get to that at some point. I'm sure uh, the Briscoes will have to build themselves back up a little bit here. If they are baby faces, are they not? Or are they heels? Uh, th- their personality is kind of anti-hero, I would say. Right, right. They they ride that uh, Steve Austin fine line where everybody can get these hands. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we've got some uh, interesting places to go with the tag team division and AEW and other promotions here going on. GCW, uh, Ring of Honor, and all that stuff. And FTR is just lighting everything up right now. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to our next topic. Uh, Ronda Rousey versus Charlotte Flair set for WrestleMania Backlash in an I Quit match. Uh, What do you think about this uh, rematch for WrestleMania Backlash, Tony? Again, because I don't care about the story one iota. Doesn't really interest me from a story perspective. However, I will tell you where it does interest me. You and me both talked about this. That match at WrestleMania was an abysmal pile of dog shit. I don't care how much you try and justify it. But it's because there was legitimately no chemistry between Ronda and Charlotte. Now you're going to put them in an I quit match. I'm not saying that Ronda or Charlotte are going to go into business for themselves. But there's a little bit more leeway with what you can get away with in one of these I quit matches. I'm predicting Charlotte goes hard way. And I think we see somebody busted open in this match. That's the only part of this that kind of has me a little perplexed to see what happens. Outside there's not a chance in a hell WWE does that. They'll they'll no, do it not- with Brock here and there, but women bleeding, there's no way. No way you know WWE story, does that. You know the story behind Brock Lesnar doing that for the first time. Yeah. Vince wasn't aware that was going to happen. Mm-hmm. All it takes is one time for something to happen. I mean, I wouldn't put it past Charlotte to go to business for herself a little bit there, pull up Bret Hart and, you know, get some color. But And that would be great if she could do it. Oh, my God. But, uh... So. I don't, I don't see that happening. Go ahead. Something fucky happens. Vince rings the bell in favor of Ronda because she's in an arm bar. Charlotte stands up, starts spitting on Vince. AEW with her hands shows up next week. She's with her husband, Andrade. Oh, okay. I mean, it'd light the internet on fire, but... <laughs> uh, but yeah, a screw job angle, yeah, I don't think they're going there. An I quit match is basically a no DQ submission match. I'm surprised they didn't go for the straight-up submission match. So you're right in that it's going to be uh, a bit more violent. There's going to be, you know, foreign objects and things like that involved, I would imagine. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to be someone... Tapping out, I would think. And I mean, you could always do something screwy and, you know, have a recording or whatever. They've done things like that before with like whip matches. But uh, well, the other the other aspect of it is, too, is, you know, why in terms of why not making it go a full blown submission match? Both these women, their finishers are submission based. Exactly. Yeah. So that's another reason to just kind of like scratch your head. Like, I think you guys might have missed the boat on this one just a little bit. Well, and then again, I think that's I think that's the angle they'll be pushing with the I quit match. But the I quit technically is a no DQ match, whereas a submission match still has your count outs and all that stuff, I believe. 
But um, who do you see going over in this match? Charlotte or Ronda? See, that's where the toss-up happens. You want to make your, I'd say, say second or third biggest female draw happy in Charlotte. But at the same time, you have the crossover appeal of Ronda. We're getting away from WrestleMania season, so not as much focus on WWE in particular. How do you bring him back in? Y- you got to put it on Ronda, you would think, right? Well, I would imagine... See, that was the thinking going into Mania, was Ronda's going to go over, she's going to get the belt, and then she'll have a run with it. But... The reason Charlotte went over is because they see multiple matches out of this feud here. And obviously, we've already got the next one scheduled at WrestleMania Backlash. That's what we're talking about. I believe... Okay, there it is. I was just looking up the next pay-per-view after Backlash, and I'll pop it up here. I believe for sure, without a doubt in my mind, Charlotte goes over in this match. And then you hit the third match where Ronda will, front, will finally go over it and look at the pay-per-view that that'll happen. Hell in a Cell. <laughs> I think that's... the ring eight sides too? Or... <laughs> Talk about more on the nose. But I, I think, uh, yeah, Hell in a Cell. On June 5th, you'll have the third and final match. It'll be the blow-off match between Ronda and Charlotte. Ronda will finally get her win there. Uh, So that means she loses here. You can't have her win here because, I mean, you could, I guess, but I would think it makes more sense for Charlotte to continue to win until you get to the blow-off match here at Hell in a Cell when you finally have Ronda go over. So let me ask. Ronda goes over at Hell in a Cell. Is it possible for her to re- retain until Survivor Series is finally giving us that Becky versus Ronda match that everybody wants? Yeah. I mean, Ronda had a hell of a run uh, when she had that WrestleMania to WrestleMania run a few years back, going up to 35. So was it 35 or 36? WrestleMania 36. Six where they made a venom? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then 37 was right. Was here in or was supposed to be here in Tampa and wasn't. Mm, no. No, no, no. It'd be it was 35. Yeah, it was 35. Yeah. So WrestleMania 35, when she had a run and they they culminated in that three-way main event match, she she had quite the run there for a while and she got the title. And then because Becky Lynch was just on another planet over. And Ronda was starting to get booze. They they flipped her heel. Will they continue to cheer her as a baby face for that run? We'll see. That would be rough, especially against Becky Lynch, who, by the way, is being an absolutely fantastic healer right now. Oh, but yeah. if, the, if that's the, the plan for a Survivor Series or a SummerSlam, wherever they're going with that, um, I think... Hmm, let me go back to this page here. So yeah, we got SummerSlam is immediately after Hell in a Cell. So SummerSlam is only a couple of months away in July. So I don't know if we go Ronda Becky there. I think Ronda will face maybe a returning Alexa Bliss or or someone else at SummerSlam. Brandy. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, let's just be honest here, and we'll we'll call it a circle a circle here. All we really care about is that Survivor Series, Rhea Ripley is the champion of Raw, and Nikita Lyons is the champion of SmackDown, and we get a 30-minute Iron Woman match. Most pinfalls win, so we could just watch that happen over and over again. <laughs> you got my money. All right, that'll do it for all our main topics here. 
we are going to be uh, going into our quick jab segment. Now, uh, we're flying through topics here, so we can spend a little bit more time on some of these than I originally intended. Um, but the first thing I want to talk about is uh, on SmackDown uh, Friday night, we had a couple of debuts. Um, one who already had his name changed and two others that had their name changed on SmackDown. Uh, Gunther debuted with uh, Ludwig Kaiser, the former Marcel Barthel, uh, in tow. And we also had uh, Raquel Rodriguez, the former Raquel Gonzalez, uh, debut on SmackDown as Raw. And I love that picture. She looks huge there. That's a, that's a great uh, promo that she did. Uh, what do you think of these uh, debuts on SmackDown and of the name changes? Raquel's already in WWE 2K22 as... Raquel Gonzalez. So to make the name change now, a little weird. Also, was not a weird, was not aware that she was that tall. Yeah. So, so now I think I'm into Amazonian women based off of Rhea Ripley and Nikita Lyons. And now Raquel. That hurts um, to the list. Yeah. But uh, do you think there's somebody back in WWE creative that is just has a search history, quick button to see what are popular SS officer names so they can avoid it when they're renaming Imperium (laughs) after the whole Gunther incident? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, they got uh, with Kaiser, like with Kaiser, they, there was some, I guess the word Kaiser in some ways is, I don't know the history of it, but something. The Kaiser is a higher up in the third right. Right. So, phew. So that had a little bit of backlash there. The implications are really heavy with what they're going with Imperium. <laughs> so, that, I mean, that's a weird one. I, I'd i never heard of either two of these uh, wrestlers, Marcel or Raquel. So it, the name change doesn't bother me that much in this case. And with uh, Raquel, I, I kind of get it. WWE has a little bit of a alliteration uh Kink, they, they, you know, hey, Ricardo Rodriguez, uh, Raquel Rodriguez, they, they like things to kind of alliterate a little bit. And so Raquel Gonzalez didn't have that flow that they th- that they feel like Raquel Rodriguez is. So we're going to debut her on our flagship show, SmackDown. Let's just tweak her last name and let it flow a little better. I think that's their thinking behind it. Don't let that billion dollar jet flying limousine ride lifestyle fool you. Vince McMahon is fully in a hundred percent from the trailer parks. So. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. We can move on to our next quick jab. Uh, Tony Khan had some interesting tweets this week about, uh, about uh, anti AEW tweets and how they're likely uh, bots. And here's the tweet here. Uh, Tony Khan said, an independent study has confirmed that much of the staunch anti-AEW online community aren't real individuals. It's a staff running thousands of accounts plus an army of bots to signal boost them. Look closely, these aren't real people. Who pay for such a wildly expensive thing? Uh, First off, what do you think about this tweet? So, here's where I'm torn. He might be on to something. If you look left, right politics, anywhere like that, it's been proven that there are bot farms that use Twitter for the express purpose of trolling people. And And of creating divisions. Absolutely. Yes. So when you see something like this over and over and over again without actually thinking to look into it for yourself, hey, this Twitter user, Dr. Eggman with the egg picture with no actual personality and he has the same tweet a hundred different times as a hundred other people who have the same tweet a hundred other times. He might be onto something. And then you create that division. It's pretty much at this point, it's old hat when it comes to the political arena. And now I think we might be seeing it firsthand with tribalism, professional wrestling, oddly enough. Yeah. Uh, I agree. I think, um, and you can see immediately below this, as this tweet blew up, he immediately used it to promote, uh, Moxley and Yuta on, on Rampage. But, um, uh, Wrestling Inc. 
uh, actually reached out to Tony Khan for clarification on that tweet. And Tony Khan responded and said this, uh, waiting for final study, but here's what my expert confirmed. It's people with real live accounts making posts and then using their bots to manipulate the social channel algorithm by backing them up with engagement from a made up Twitter identity. Social media teams will often fight on this. Bots are great for numbers and when they're gone, you'll see a dip in digital conver- conversation impressions. Both, the, both of those were either negative sentiment or not real anyway. So what, what he's saying here is that uh, basically someone tweets out something anti-AEW. That's generally a real person tweeting out something anti. But what's happening is they, they have a whole bunch of bots following them. And that will get retweeted by all the bots. So then it gets pushed higher up in the Twitter algorithm and more people see it. And it's it's kind of a shit rolls downhill kind of deal where, okay, now more people are seeing it, more people are retweeting it. And now it's a big deal when probably no one would have seen this anti-AEW tweet to begin with if it weren't getting uh, retweeted by bots. So I actually have some odd experiences with this and firsthand knowledge of what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, So as you know, I do TikTok is what it is. It's fun. It's a creative outlet for me. Yeah. But I've amassed a following on there. Check them out at the Grizzly Villain. It's right there on the screen, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. But it gets to a point where you get so many followers where you have people reach out to you on other forms of social media asking you if you want to double or triple your followers and you just pay them some nominal fee and somehow they magically do it. Well, one time curiosity got the best of me and I actually asked the guy, Hey, how do you guarantee more and more followers and all this stuff? If I pay you this money and they tell you it's bot farm. Yep. They will get, I mean, a perfect example of this. I think it was uh, Justin Bieber like two years ago. Lost like half his follower account on Twitter because it was all bots. These are bought and paid for likes, follows, retweets. So he's on to something with that. But at the same time, though, with that being said, I do think that there is some brand of traditional tribalism that comes from people who are pining for another Monday night war because maybe they just weren't old enough or didn't watch wrestling at the time during that era and they want to see what the hype was really about for themselves and I mean you had two perfect contenders coming in for it still the dark empire WWE versus another product that is yet again on a Turner brand I mean it, it's right in itself but at the same time you know, sure. bots are bots what are you going to do you see this uh... Obviously, in wrestling, certainly in politics, uh, tribalism, division, confirmation bias, all that kind of stuff. F- probably the best example is politics. But you see it in all kinds of different fandoms, not just pro wrestling. You see it in comic books, Marvel versus DC. You'll see it in... Star Wars versus uh, Battlestar Galactica. Or just, just within Star Wars. You've got fans of the originals versus fans of the prequels versus fans of the sequel trilogy that Disney just put out. There are people that love the prequels that people my generation hated but those prequel lovers hate the sequels i'm like i love all star wars so you have it's even multi-layered in some fandoms not to mention the whole yeah star trek versus star wars and things like that that have died actually died down some it's all usually inter-fandom stuff now which is crazy but here, yeah, you've got obviously WWE versus AEW when it's like, f- fucking, you love wrestling. Why do you have to turn one down for the other? The more wrestling that's on TV, the better. If you don't like, I don't like a lot of WWE's style and presentation of it, but there's still some fantastic matches. You can't deny that. And the same thing with AEW. Some of what they do, especially their first couple of years of existence in, on TNT with Dynamite, there is some garbage stuff with some low-rent independent performers, in my opinion. But as they built up and as they got stars, their matches got better and better and better. And now we're seeing some fantastic shit out of AEW. Why do you want to hate on that? It doesn't make sense to me. My personal opinion is, is if you love professional wrestling, not everything has to be your cup of tea. 
Perfect example. Agreed. I'm a big fan of deathmatch style and strong style. Whereas you're more of a fan of more traditional yeah. templates of wrestling. Neither one of us are right or wrong in what we love about professional wrestling because that's the professional wrestling umbrella as a whole. At the end of the day, what it boils down to is did those performers just leave everything they had in that ring for your hard-earned dollar? Agreed. Is this promotion doing the best to be the best by the fan? And most importantly, at the end of the day, are we not so much enjoying because that's subjective but can you appreciate the art you can have disagreements you cannot agree on the same thing but as long as you both enjoy something and you're trying to turn other people on to that by showing them what you enjoy just let it go let it go go full else on this bitch all right we'll move on to the next jab this one's a little bit of a controversial one i don't want to dwell too long on some of the uh, aspects of this one because there's there's a lot to this but the uh nxt tag team titles have been relinquished following the release of nash carter after allegations surfaced uh of abuse from his wife and after a certain picture uh what do you think about this what do you think about the future of the nxt tag team titles and and uh wwe this this is their post here about them being relinquished on their website, and it says the it's very short blob. The current tag team titles have re, or champions have relinquished the titles. New champions will be crowned this Tuesday. Uh, so, do you, where do you think first? Let's very quickly go over or what you think about uh, Nash Carter being released, and then where you think the NXT tag team titles are headed. All right. So, real quick, if it's true what they said about Nash Carter and what he did to Kimberly, was her name right? Yes. If there's truth to that, Nash Carter, the things I would like to do in Nash Carter, if those are actually proven true, that's neither here nor there. However, I think with them getting rid of Nash Carter as quickly as they did, it's kind of uh, harkens back to the whole Velotine Dream situation where allegations came out against him that were disgusting and yeah. eventually found to be true. And even though they were proven to be true, WWE wanted to do their own internal investigation. And it, unfortunately, in this case, didn't jump the gun like they've been quick to do in the past and let him continue wrestling for months and months. Um, but then you had to think about things like Enzo. Was Enzo was everybody's cup of tea? No. But when the accusations came out before they even finished their investigation, they distanced themselves from Enzo. Um, with the Nash Carter incident, if it's true, he doesn't deserve to work ever again. He shouldn't be allowed to work in Puerto Rico. He shouldn't be allowed to work in Argentina. I, I, that's just personally me. Um, as far as the picture that was released and a way to hurt his character, everybody knows who that is. Everybody knows it's wrong. But if you ask any guy who's ever shaved a day in their life, if they've never shaved their mustache into that, when they've had to do a full shave before, I will show you a person who's full of shit because there's only one, been one person that's tried to pull that look off since that certain thing happened. And that's Michael Jordan. And I don't know if that's just money that can make you bulletproof from that, or if it's just the fact that he's the goat of basketball, but you don't see that style too often. <laughs> No, I I don't disagree with you there on, on that when it comes to shaving the beard. I've never done it personally, but I've, I've shaved and certainly when I've gone to shave and I'm like, ooh, let me have a handlebar mustache for five seconds. Click. Oh, that looks fun. All right. Now it's coming off. And then that's probably what happened here. It was probably nothing, you know, meant to be demeaning in any way, but you know, me shaving a handlebar mustache and taking a picture of it versus me doing that and taking a picture of it. You're setting yourself up for this kind of thing. You know, don't take a picture of it. Well, let me ask you this. But I, I, I agree in theory that it probably wasn't what he was intending to send some sort of message. But have you ever sent something to somebody in confidence knowing that if it ever got to the general public, 
you might be in some hot water. I'm sure a lot of people have. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, everybody does. And the, the thing of us going back through and canceling people for that, on the grand scheme of what Nash Carter is being accused of, that should be peanuts in comparison to a man putting hands on a female. So for everybody to keep hearkening back on that when the true reality of what he was originally accused of is much darker, I, I, I think we need to get our priorities straight. As, mm-hmm. I'm talking IWC as a whole. Uh, now, if you listen to his tag team partner, and I'm forgetting his name off the top of my head. Oh, no, Wes- listen- Wesley, I believe. Yes, Wesley. If you listen to Wesley's wife and all the evidence that she's brought forth about the accusations being incredible or incredible due to a divorce papers that were handed over to Kimberly, there's so many goddamn leads in this story. It's hard to keep track of them. But if you listen to that too, it also makes you think, you know, could it be that? Unfortunately, and you know, we've talked about this outside of here. The Me Too movement was something that was really great that needed to happen, right? A hundred percent. And unfortunately, towards the end of it, we saw it get hijacked by a lot of really bad actors who saw potential to monetize it for themselves. And it kind of muddied the water in what we were supposed to do with that movement. I didn't I didn't see the hijacking as much as, as you do, but and certainly overall, I, I think it, Me Too and, and giving these kind of allegations the attention and seriousness that it deserves is 100% a good thing. And certainly if there's an overcorrection, because of the history of how women have been treated, if there's an overcorrection and maybe a few allegations that are false kind of come through the leaks, you know, that's almost to be expected because it's been so far skewed the other way for so long that – you're going to have a period of overcorrection. That's okay. It may not be fair to some people, but it's what's going to happen. It's natural. It's society now, now that you're going to have that thing. And again, I don't want to get too deep into this. There is some weirdness going on and some back and forth. Uh, you know, we don't need to get any deeper into it. Um, there are these allegations out there. Um, they deserve to be taken seriously. And at the very least, that's all that needs to be said, and then we can let things play out from there in the legal system. And at the end of the day, in the public sphere, it's going to play out for sure, no matter what, regardless of what happens in the legal system. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think that's all we got to say about that. Or, or what do you think about the tag team titles? Uh, is switch back to wrestling for a minute here? Dirty what? dogs. Okay. All right, I don't. I haven't been watching NXT, so I don't. I don't know where they're headed with that. But as far as I know, uh, you know, you have Dolph Ziggler still involved with NXT. He just yeah. lost the NXT championships. You have a vacated tag team championship for what I believe Robert Roode, entertainer, entertaining as hell when it comes to professional wrestling, but he does some of his best work in tag team wrestling. Looking back to TNA when he was in Beer Money with James Storm, Dolph Ziggler, entertaining as hell, put him in a team with somebody that he actually likes, like Robert Roode, Dirty Dogs, NXT Champions, fucking Prince Money on its own. All right, sounds good. All right, the next uh, jab to the face here. Another uh, one that's a little tough to talk about, uh, Tammy Sitch the former Sonny in the WWF, uh, she had a terrible incident uh, this a couple of weeks ago, apparently, March 25th in uh, Ormond Beach, which Tony and I both know is just north of Daytona, um, where she uh, rear-ended a car at about 8.30 p.m. on US-1 in Ormond Beach. And that the car she rear-ended uh, was at a stoplight, and it hit another car in front of it. And there was a 75-year-old man in that car that she hit that passed away. And now it looks like uh, she's being investigated that she it, she may have been under the influence of what we don't know. They're waiting on uh, tests to come back, test results to come back. But uh, sad news for Tammy. Maybe, unfortunately, 
I don't know if I'd call it necessarily surprising news, but certainly sad news for Tammy here. What do you think about this? I, my take might be a little bit harsher than everybody else's. And I realize this, but I don't feel any sympathy for Tammy Sitch, especially if she was under the influence of something. No, a hundred percent. I mean, I feel sympathy, know. but yeah. How do you feel sympathy for somebody in 2022 when you're under the influence and there's something as easy as I'm going to push this on the screen of my phone and I have somebody coming to pick me up. For sure. You know, For and sure. even years before that, you could call a taxi, anything like that. These are things that are extremely important to me. And another reason, like, yes, you see me and Bobby on the stream right now enjoying a few adult beverages. Well, we're in the comforts of our own home. Hell yeah, go to a bar, burn it down. Have a DD, use an Uber. This shit isn't rocket scientists. This shit hasn't changed in hundreds of, no, fuck not hundreds, but, you know, the past 56 years, this shit hasn't changed. Use a cab. Be smart. Get home safe. DUI, DWI laws are in existence. My condolences, and I absolutely feel sorry for the family of the 75-year-old man, but you have somebody like Tammy Sitch who is an adult, and again, this boils back down to Unfortunately, what we see with professional wrestlers living a rock star lifestyle for so long that the roles of law versus how much your body can handle with drugs and alcohol kind of get blurred. So hopefully at the end of the day, the biggest takeaway is hopefully Tammy finally gets the help she needs. Certainly, I hope so. Uh, yeah, I feel bad, obviously, for the family of the of the man that died. Um it's just a heartbreaking situation. I'm not going to say I don't feel, even if she was over the under the influence, I, I feel sympathy for her in that addiction to some bitch. And obviously for a long time, you know, she's had issues and there are times she's come out of them a little bit here and there and then fallen right back into them. Um, hopefully, hopefully regardless of the outcome of these results, hopefully she was sober. And it was just some sort of freak accident because uh, you certainly don't want to see her in jail. But uh, And these are all things, too, that are in the realms of possibility. Accidents do happen. 100%. So, unfortunately, assuming that she was under the influence of something is a little bit premature on everybody's part. But given her history, I could see why they want to investigate it as such. Let's see. And you can see I have the original uh, TMZ sports article up. They're the ones that obtained this information from the Ormond Beach police that uh, that they're looking into and investigating whether or not she was under the influence. They suspect it, apparently. But there's, there's no proof yet. They're waiting on test results, so we'll see what happens with that. Uh, but... Regardless, a sad, sad situation with Tammy Sitch here. All right, uh, we'll move on to our last quick jab to the face. Uh, some happy news here. Carmella and Corey Graves got married last week. Uh, just some fun pictures that came out of that wedding. Some uh, interpromotional pictures that have fans abuzz, which is always, always fun to hear that uh, conversation online. Uh, what'd you think about, uh, this, uh, the wedding here and some of the pictures you've seen from it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's really beautiful when you see rich people affording really rich weddings. Um, I think the biggest story here is the fact that John Moxley lives his gimmick. I think that's the biggest and most important news to come out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. He... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to a wedding wearing my wrestling boots and a Bengals hoodie. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, there's there's also uh, we just got this news just before we went uh, live on the air here and started recording. But Alexa Bliss also got married. Uh, I don't know if it was today or yesterday and pictures have started to come out. There was a picture. Let me see if I can find it here where with Braun Strowman at the wedding. And he was also a la John Moxley, not dressed up. He was just in like it looked like an Under Armour cut off shirt. So <laughs> So uh, I don't know if I can find that. There are all these pictures here. Down here in the comments. I don't see Braun in any of them. 
And I'll tell you what, Ryan Cabrera has to be the most secure motherfucker on the face of the earth, knowing that you got Ryan Shear just waiting in the ways for you to mess up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, let me see if I can find... You guys will forgive me for a moment while I scroll on Twitter, but I, I thought it was great. It was... Uh... Did he still have the makeshift Legion of Doom Mohawk that he's got going on? Or oh, my Twitter's freezing up here. Give me a moment. I mean, oh, there it is. Of there it is, right oh. there. You can start he to still see has it, the yeah. hawk. Uh, it's all going crazy. I'm going to click on it. I don't know what's going on with my Twitter. Everything's taking a while. There it is. He's wearing pink nonetheless. They're pink, they're, yeah. I love it. Well, it, apparently that was... It looks like everyone was wearing pink, so apparently that was the theme. So he, he wore pink, <laughs> a pink like Under Armour shirt, a pink belt with his jeans... And then pink Crocs. I don't know if you see the Crocs down there. <laughs> I was looking at that and I was like, is he wearing fucking Crocs? <laughs> so, yeah, some some good stories here to add on. Uh, Corey and Camilla got married. Alexis Bliss got married. And uh, some fun pictures came out of both of them. Uh, anything else you want to add? Man. Go ahead. It, it's springtime. Love is in the air, man. Let's just hope. Now, we don't know how much it is from the female wrestler's perspective, but let's just hope that that uh, former professional wrestling lifestyle doesn't get the better of these two relationships and they're able to manage a long, happy, and healthy love going forward. Absolutely. Anything else you want to add that you saw in wrestling this week or any news that you want to talk about? For the love of everything holy. Let me just lead into next week's heat seeker segment, which we are coming back with. Next week's heat seeker segment is going to be about, in fact, professional wrestling tribalism and why yeah. it's okay that we can love both companies or three companies. Hell, get as poly as you want with your love for professional wrestling. Just don't dog everybody else when they aren't on board with your bullshit. I love it. I agree completely. All right. That'll do it for this episode of the Bubble Bomb Show. Episode four, after last week's crazy live streams. Tony, it's been a great time talking professional wrestling with you, buddy. As always, brother. All right, man. Remember to like, subscribe, comment below. Let us know what you think. We'll see you guys next week. Never break, always fight, never quit. Game, win your life, have no shame, there's no time for the pain, let the grind, I could change in my mind, pick a lane, commit and climb, the only way to win it life. I never miss that stack, taking big swings, bitch, hand me the bat, put me in the ring, you'll go out in a bag, cause I sing what I mean and I bring it to the mad light. Ain't got time to kill, I got time to fail, I took the red pill, I know life's short so I